それでは次のセッションを始めさせていただきます。えっと、次のセッションは、えっと、素粒子物理学の研究分野で、えっと、GPU が活用されている内容をご紹介させていただきます。NVIDIA の、えーえっと、HPC コンピュータエンジニアサイエンティストでもあるんですが、えっと、マイク・クラークから、えっと、ご紹介させていただきます。Mike, please start. Okay, thank you, Hirano san. So, today I will be talking to you about an application called Lattice QCD, specifically more of an algorithmic focus. And this is much more of a research talk than the prior talks in this session. So,、um, the results are less polished、um, because this is ongoing research. This was done in collaboration with、uh, Richard Brower and Michael Chang at Boston University.、Um, so, the name of this talk is Hierarchical Algorithms on Heterogeneous Architectures. Hierarchical algorithms in this case means multi grid. Heterogeneous architectures mean s CPU and GPU. So, the talk I'm going to give, I'll start off with an introduction to Lattice QCD, Lattice Quantum Chromodynamics. I'll explain to you what that is in two or three slides.、Um, this work's been done in the context of a library called the CUDA library. It's a, a library designed to do QCD calculations on the CUDA architecture. I'll then talk about the main research aspect of this, which is putting multi grid algorithms onto heterogeneous architectures, and summarize towards the end. So, on the diagram on the top right here, we've got、um, a diagram of what the, the structure of the atom looks like. If you look right in the center here, you have the nucleus. The nucleus is made up of neutrons and protons. And you go even closer inside there, they're made up of quarks.、Um, these little labels here, U's and D's,、um, Are the types of quarks, in this case, up and down. Now, the strong force is the force which holds together the nucleus, that, that binds together the, nu the neutrons and the protons, both within the nucleus and the actual, binding the actual neutrons and protons together. The, the theory of the strong force is called QCD, quantum chromodynamics. Now, it's a very simple theory to write down, very beautiful path integral here. Unfortunately,、um, it's a nonlinear. Theory, so, you cannot solve it using perturbative means like you can do with quantum electrodynamics. So, you have to resort to numerical simulation.、Um, quantum chromodynamics、um, gives rise to all the neutrons and protons and, and pions, a whole spectrum of different particles that you can observe in nature, in the same way that you have the periodic table coming out of chemistry. So, because the theory is nonlinear, you have to use、um, numerical methods. The, the numerical method of choice is called lattice QCD. And you take the original infinite、um, space time and you、uh, discretize it so it, become, it goes on to a four dimensional lattice, which is where the lattice, in, lattice QCD comes from. You finitize it, imposing periodic boundary conditions at the end of the boxes, at the end of each of the boxes' dimensions. And the, Partial differential equations in the original theory now become finite difference equations. What Lattice QCD is, is a high precision tool that allows physicists to explore the contents of a nucleus from the comfort of the workstation, or actually from their supercomputer because it's a very computationally expensive、um, uh, subject. And it actually consumes、um, 10 to 20% of all North American supercomputing cycles. And this is the, also true in Japan and in Europe as well. It's a very big Um, supercomputing application. Now, most of the computational cost、uh, arises in the sparse linear solver.、Um, and that's、um, shown here.、Um, D is the Dirac operator, and that describes fermionic interactions.、Um, and what this D here is actually is a sparse matrix, and that's the discretized PDE.、Um, and so this is the AX equals B, the linear system that you need to solve in QCD.、Um, this picture here is just taken as a simulation from Lattice QCD where the、um, The quarks inside, the, in, inside a neutron or in a proton are being, are being pulled apart, and you can see the lines of flux. So, this is a, an ab initio calculation coming out of a lattice QCD simulation. Now, you can take these simulation results, compare them to what you get in the Large Hadron Collider、um, or other、um, experimental、um, colliders, and what you want to look for is an agreement between lattice QCD and experiment. And so the plot on the right hand side here is showing the ratio between、uh, a lattice QCD result and an experimental result. And what you want to see is that ratio was close to one within errors. And that's showing you that the theory of QCD matches the experiment, verifying the theory of QCD.
Now, there's many Lattice QCD applications out there. Um, I just give some examples here of common ones used. So, Milk is a, a commonly used one. Um, I'm also listing how are these applications written. So, Milk is written in, in C, it's an MPI application. Um, CPS um, is written in C++ uh, and it uses MPI and some threads. Uh, Chroma is a C++ expression template programming. It's built on top of a domain specific language and it uses MPI and threads. Um, BQCD is one called Berlin QCD and that's written in Fortran. Now each of these applications consists of 100,000 to maybe a million lines of code. And so porting each of these applications individually would be very challenging. There's been many, many man years of effort put into creating these applications. And so if we want these applications to run well on GPUs, we have to think of a, a good, efficient way of doing so. That's where the CUDA library comes in. So CUDA stands for QCD on CUDA. It's an open source project. Um, it started as a research um, summer project in Boston University when I was a postdoc there a few years ago, um, just experimenting to see how well um, this GPU architecture um, could be used uh, for lattice QCD calculations. And it's evolved into a production library used for accelerating all of these uh, applications I just listed uh, and others as well. So these, uh, CUDA defines, uh, is a library which creates an interface for other applications to plug into so applications can be easily GPU accelerated. So it provides all the features that a QCD physicist needs, such as um, linear solvers for all the different discretizations they need, supports multiple GPUs, and other additional routines needed for the Monte Carlo molecular dynamics generation stage. Um, I'm not gonna focus on the physics at all in this talk, more talk about the algorithms and some of the methods for getting high performance. But the goal of this library is to maximize the performance, which means minimizing the time to science. Um, so maximizing performance means exploiting all the symmetries of the problem to minimize memory traffic, because memory traffic for any kind of sparse linear system is what costs um, performance, because these are always bandwidth bound. Um, using mixed precision methods, um, so using mixed precision solvers where you do most of the work in low precision, and by low precision here I mean single precision or even 16-bit precision, but still using occasional double precision, double precision corrections to maintain full precision in the final result. Using auto-tuning techniques to get maximum performance regardless if you're running on a GPU from, um, from this year or from two years ago, but you always want to get maximum performance without having to rewrite your codes. Um, using special preconditioners to minimize communication to get good strong scaling so you can run on thousands of GPUs simultaneously. And what I'm talking about today is multi-grid solvers um, which are op, uh, linear solvers that give optimal convergence. Now the Dirac, Dirac operator is the linear system which appears in QCD. And I've just sketched out the Dirac operator in this slide here. The exact structure isn't that important for this talk. What is important is just to see that um, when you discretize this thing, what you end up with is a stencil operator. It's on a four dimensional grid. Um, it's radius one. It's first order PDE um, acting with the background field. The background field is called the gauge field, which is the, the QCD field which describes the underlying quantum chromodynamics theory. But it's just a large sparse matrix. Um, as I said, it's a stencil operator. And to solve the linear system with this guy as the linear system, you typically use iterative solvers such as conjugate gradient by CG stab or multigrid as we'll be talking about. So the first thing you want to do when you're porting QCD code to a GPU is you need to map the application of the Dirac operator stencil to a vector, um, or a, a, the application of the stencil to the grid, because that's the key operation which will appear in the linear solver um, algorithm. So for porting something into GPU, you need parallelism. And QCD has a lot of, uh, an, abundance of pan, uh, an abundance of parallelism because you assign a different thread to each space-time point. You have a four-dimensional grid, and typically per GPU you might have something like 24 to the four um, sites, and so each one of these sites corresponds to a different thread. And so you have many, many threads, which, which means that you have a nice data parallel program which is well mapped to a GPU. Um, each thread must then apply the stencil to the a given site that it's responsible for updating. So that means if I'm updating this site here, and I've got a thread here, this thread's got to load in the neighboring sites in four dimensions, 
um, load in, the, um, if, if load in the, the matrix which lives between these sites here, which is the underlying QCD matrix, um, do some computation and store the result here. Now, this is a very memory-bound operation, so CUDA reduces memory traffic by using compression and similarity transforms and using 16-bit precision. Um, the basic goal here is just to maximize performance. And for going to multiple GPUs, you can use MPI and you can use CUDA Stream API to overlap the computation on the interior sites with the communication of the boundary terms to get good strong scaling. When you put all this together, you get the results shown in this plot here. Now what I'm comparing is the performance of a CPU only code. Uh, the application here is called Chroma and that's the blue line here. What we're showing on the X axis is increasing the number of nodes where each node here is a dual socket, so two CPUs. Um, and then we add GPU acceleration. Um, so for the GPU accelerated nodes here are the, is the green line here. That's one CPU plus one GPU. So we're taking away one CPU and replacing it with one GPU. Um, now what you find is that the GPU um, has got very good strong scaling early on and you get a nice six um, to eight X speed up um, for a small number of nodes. But then when you go to the larger number of nodes, the GPU strong scaling plateaus. It does also for the CPU as well. But what we do at this point is we turn on better preconditioners which minimize communication and you can see that a GPU calculation can run over 1,000 GPUs and still get a good speed up versus uh, a CPU system. So here, this is three and a half X speed up, but that's three and a half versus two CPUs per node. So it's actually seven X for one GPU to one CPU. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the story though. That's only for simple algorithms, such as conjugate gradient by CG stab or even GCR, which is a, a Krilov solver. What has more recently been found is that using multi-grid solvers give much better performance than the traditional Krilov approaches. So the disadvantage with Krilov methods is that they scale poorly with increasing condition number. And QCD, the QCD matrix, the Dirac matrix, has a parameter called the mass parameter. And as you take the mass parameter smaller towards the physical point where reality is, where the real world is, the condition number gets worse and worse. And so as you decrease the quark mass, as shown on the x-axis here, the number of seconds or the number of iterations in your linear solver increases. If you switch to a better algorithm, so multigrid, you have almost uh, no dependence in the quark mass. And so you want to run simulations down here. And so when you run using multigrid, you get a very big speed up. These are results shown from BlueGene. We want to run this algorithm on GPUs. So what is this multigrid algorithm? So I'll just motivate what multigrid is to begin with. Multigrid comes from the observation that simple iterative solvers are very good at reducing high frequency error components, but what they leave behind and are very, they're very poor at um, minimizing are the low frequency error components. So if we take for a simple example, a uh, Laplace operator in two dimensions, I'm going to give it an initial random guess and solve the system AX equals zero. Now AX equals zero is special because the initial guess or the iterate to any given iteration is equal to the error. The error is just minus the current um, value of x because the exact solution is zero. We're going to apply Gauss-Seidel to this system. So we start off, the error components are all random, then we apply Gauss-Seidel, and what you see is that the error components in the high frequency are very quickly reduced, and what's left are smooth, low frequency error components. So uh, iterative solvers are very good at getting rid of high frequency components, but they leave behind low frequency components. And this is what motivates multigrid. The low frequency error components are smooth, so these can be accurately represented in a coarse grid. Once they're on a coarse grid, um, they're no longer low frequency components anymore. They're now high frequency components because the lattice spacing, the grid spacing has changed. So using simple relaxation or iterative techniques are very good at removing um, the high frequency components now on the coarse grid. And now you can interpolate, interpolate the result back to the fine grid. And this is a recursive algorithm, so you can do this at multiple levels if you have many different levels of, uh, if you have a very wide spectrum of frequencies. So the multigrid method is spelled out as follows. You smooth on the original fine system, which means just apply your iterative solver, compute a residual, restrict that residual to a coarser grid, um, 
then you can recurse on this coarse problem. So then when you go to a coarser problem, smooth, computer residual, and go to a coarser grid again, and you can go all the way down until you've made your problem small enough, you can do an exact solve, and then prolongate it back up again, where you're smoothing it each step as you're going back up again. Now, the advantage of multigrid that has optimal scaling. Optimal means it has linear scaling with the problem size, and it has a convergence rate independent of the condition number. Now, for QCD, we have to use a special algorithm called adaptive multigrid. I'm not going to talk about the details of that, but it requires all the same components as regular um, geometric multigrid. And it actually uses the null space components, so the near zero um, uh, eigenvectors of the original operator to construct the prolongation operator. Prolongation is the, is the operator which defines how to connect the coarse grid to the fine grid. The motivation for doing this is that if you don't use multigrid in the GPU, then just running multigrid in the CPU will be faster than running the naive algorithm in the GPU. So for competitive, you need multigrid running in the GPU. So what we seek here is the multiplicative gain of having the best algorithm and the best architecture, giving you a big speed up. So on the right-hand side here, I'm showing CUDA running a simple by CG stab solver on 32 GPUs, and it takes 60 seconds to solve. Um, Multigrid here running on the CPU on 16 dual socket nodes, so 32 CPUs, is actually faster than the GPU. So what we want to do is take this algorithm and run it on the GPU. Now, multigrid on the GPU is not so simple. Um, the GPU requirements are very different from the CPU. Each thread is very slow in a GPU, but you have 10,000 threads. So the fine grids, the original problem, runs very efficiently on the GPU because you've got a high parallel um, data parallel throughput problem. The coarse grids, as you go to coarser and coarser degrees of freedom, you have the worst possible scenario because you potentially could have more cores in your GPU than you have degrees of freedom. So you've got more cores than the number of um, grid points. Um, this means that the coarse grids are going to be more serial and latency bound and Little's law will come into play, which tells you the minimum number of bytes you have to transfer in order to maximize the bandwidth sustained. Um, so the coarse grids could become the Amdahl's limiter. So the important observation to make is that multigrid actually decomposes the problem into throughput and latency parts. So we have a throughput processor and we have a latency processor here. So when we're writing optimal multigrid that's going to strong scale to thousands of GPUs and CPUs, we need to think about decomposing the problem into throughput and latency. So run the fine grids on the GPU and the coarse grids on the CPU. So the design goals we want when we're making this algorithm, um, we need to be high performance because if we don't make it high performance, then um, uh, uh, we, we, won't, we won't be able to beat down the CPU, which has the faster algorithm. And then conversely, the GPU has very high, the regular GPU implementation um, the naive implementation is very efficiently implemented. So we need to make sure that our implementation is very efficient for the best algorithm. Um, we want to be completely flexible. We want to decide at runtime whether we're deploying a given stage of the calculation on the CPU or the GPU. So we can make this an auto-tuning decision. Is it, is it faster to run on the CPU or is it faster to run the GPU? So we can auto-tune for a given heterogeneous architecture. At which point you offload a calculation to the CPU or the GPU may depend on how many GPUs you've got on a node? How big is your CPU? Are you running on a little ARM CPU or is it a big power CPU? That will, def that, that will give you a different uh, optimal point. So the short term, we just want to make these optimal solvers for these legacy applications. Long term, what we seek is an algorithmic, um, hierarch hierarchical algorithm algorithmic toolbox. So there's little to no barrier to trying new algorithms as we explore new algorithms for the exascale. So the ingredients we need are very simple. Um, if we think about this from a parallel point of view, we have prolongation, um, sorry, the prolongation construction, that's a special phase in the adaptive algorithm. Um, the only algorithm that you really need there is a batched QR decomposition. So we, we, we know what that is from a linear algebra point of view. Um, smoothing is just um, taking the original um, <coughs> stencil operator that we, we talked about earlier and just repurposing that because you're just using the original iterative solver to remove the high frequency components. Prolongation is taking the coarse grid and turning it into the fine grid. This is a one-to-many mapping that's easy to paralyze. What does that say? Okay, five. Um, the restriction is the opposite, so many-to-one mapping. Um, the, uh, there's a potential here for race conditions. You have to be careful how you do this. Um, 
Uh, the course operator construction, so that's just in the setup phase, that's, but that's just basically batch dense matrix multiplication. Um, you need a coarse grid solver, which potentially is a direct solve. And uh, you always want to parallelize on the fine degrees of freedom, not the coarse degrees of freedom, because the fine degrees of freedom have got more parallelism, so they're going to run well in the GPU. Basically, what we've discovered is that parallel multigrid just uses common parallel primitives and algorithms. So QR decomposition, dense matrix multiplication, and we can use other things like reductions and sorts. So what we use is a library called CUB, which contains all these parallel primitives, and they're very high performance and portable across different GPU architectures. Because we're writing code that runs in the GPU or the CPU, we want to make sure that we want to only write the same piece of code once. We don't want to write the same algorithms over and over again. So we hide everything behind C++ templates and to abstract away the architecture specifics, such as the order you're storing a field in, precision, intrinsics, caching uh, modifiers, etc. So the difference between the CPU and the GPU code is almost non-existent. Um, the CPU and GPU kernels are actually calling the same functions. The only essential difference is the index computation. On a CPU code, you're going to have a for loop. On a GPU code, it's just a thread index. But aside from that, as I'll show you in the next slide, they're almost identical. The only other exception is just when doing reductions. Um, on a CPU, you'd be using an, maybe an OpenMP reduction clause, um, whereas in the GPU code, we'd be using CUB. So I've got an illustration on this slide here. On the left-hand side, I've got a CPU code. Um, so it's, it's a, it takes some template parameters. And I've got a for loop here. So over x equals 0, x is less than size, where size is just the number of um, grid points. And then I'm going to call some function called bar. And all the, that's, this is where bar is defined up here. This is the actual algorithm is implemented here. So I'm going to do some loading. I'm going to do some computation. And I'm going to save the result. The GPU code is over here. Now, instead of doing a for index, all I've got is a thread index calculation, but then I call exactly the same function. These both call the same things here. So 99% of the code uh, is in this independent, platform independent stuff here, so we write the algorithm once. And then all we have to do to create a CPU code and a GPU code is instantiate some templates. Now when we put all this together, um, the results are shown in this plot here. The black line is, is the convergence history so basically, the residual, if you know what um, a linear solver, um, if, what a residual means from a linear solver point of view, the, the L2 norm of the residual, um, basically this is a measure of how far from the true solution you are. Um, going with the number of iterations of the solver. Before we add multigrid, we have this convergence history like this. After we add the multigrid preconditioner, you can see you converge in about 10 iterations. You can see it's a very quick iteration. Here, the red line um, with multigrid, the course is part of the the solver is running in the CPU. So the multigrid correction comes for free because the, the GPU would be doing the stuff, at the, the fine grid computation anyway. It's not quite for free, but it's almost for free. Um, so the current status is that we fully um, numerically met, uh, verified the uh, multigrid algorithm and they're getting consistent results with the previous um, publications. The framework is still a bit slow. So the host code has not been optimized at all. Um, I haven't really applied OpenMP parallelization and the GPU and CPU transfers that have to appear um, where you offload calculation to the CPU and back to the GPU have not been done optimally yet. Um, uh, another problem, actually, is that compilation and link time has increasingly become a problem. As you add more and more C++ template instantiation, you get an, a very long compilation time, um, which is, makes things a little bit troublesome for debugging. But um, we're thinking that perhaps JIT compilation would help here, where you only compile um, what you need when you run it. Um, the early observations are that we can use very low precision um, and it doesn't affect the convergence at all. Um, and that means you get a big speed up because if you use lower precision, um, you've got less memory traffic. And so if your memory uh, bandwidth bound, you're going to get a good speed up. Um, the coarse grid solve actually is very, can be very poorly conditioned because that's actually where, since all the low frequency components are represented in the coarse grid, that's where the high condition number can be. And so you actually need you can't use 16-bit precision there. You've got to use single precision. Um, the next steps are just to optimize it, so using some vectorization for the CPU and some kernel fusion on the GPU. Um, optimize the transfers in CPU and GPU. Importantly, look at strong scaling. We've only done tests on a couple of GPUs. We really want to be running this in thousands of GPUs. 
The fun now starts, though. Algorithmic research, where we can think about looking at precision, um, looking at optimal coarse grid solvers, um, investigating different ways of uh, mixing the CPU and GPU running at the same time. Um, the real goal is to develop asynchronous solvers for future heterogeneous architectures. So you've seen diagrams, you've seen pictures like this already in, in the, the keynote this morning. This is what heterogeneous computing is going to look like in 2016, where we have a Tesla GPU connected to the CPU, perhaps um, around 100 gigabytes per second, some local stacked memory at one terabyte per second, and, and the CPU is going to be able to read its memory about the same speed as NVLink. So what we want to really develop is scalable solvers for this architecture, because this, um, this is what heterogeneous computing is going to look like soon. So just to summarize, I gave you a, a quick introduction to the CUDA library and some of the research which is taking place in this library. It's, um, it's a production library already at the moment um, where it deploys scalable linear solvers and has coverage for all the common lattice QCD algorithms. Uh, all the research efforts at the moment are focused on optimal linear solver techniques, so adaptive multigrid algorithms. We've got all the framework worked out, which is taking quite a lot of, a lot, quite a lot of, um, a lot, a lot of work. But now it's time for the fun um, that we can um, get a good speed up for science and um, really explore future algorithms for scalability and optimality. optimality. Um, and there should be good lessons learned here for thinking about algorithms which run on exascale machines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. すいません。あ、日本語で失礼します。えっと、計算には16ビットの不動小数点をお使いなんですか。For the calculation I using a 16-bit uh, floating point. Um for I'm using 16-bit um a uh, fixed point, actually. Um, but I al so in the mixed precision solver, I always make sure that I use double precision correction on the outer solver, so it's only on an inner preconditioner, which is in 16-bit precision. So the final answer is always good to low precision. So the final answer is always good to high precision. So it's only for preconditioner, is the low precision. So it's a free lunch. Thank you. You have uh, shown a slide where um, you have introduced some uh, optimization for memory bandwidth for stencil codes. Uh -huh. uh, I think you talked about vector compression. Uh, uh, matrix some, compression, yes. Uh, matrix I, compression. Sure. Uh, could you extend on this? Yes. Uh, um, can I have the slide back, please? Thank you. Um, this is... Yeah, so... I'll go here. So the stencil here is this um, tensor um, product structure here. The U matrices, which appear in here, are 3 by 3 complex um, matrices, so 18 real numbers. Uh, QCD matrices are called SU3, so special unitary group of size 3. Um, so they have, um, they're constrained to have um, determinant equals 1. And so that constraint means you only need 8 numbers to store that, to store that matrix completely. And so you, what we do is um, store the only 8 numbers, or sometimes, on, or sometimes just 12 numbers, because storing with 8 numbers has a slight numerical instability load those numbers into the registers and then reconstruct the full matrix once it's in registers. So it adds extra computation, so you're exchanging computation for memory traffic. Um, but because you're memory bound, it gives you a big speed up. And it saves memory as well, which is nice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Do you think uh, it would be useful to use CUDA's functionality to launch uh, CUDA kernel from inside of another CUDA kernel to implement this? Uh, using nested parallelism, yeah. or, um, yes. Um, there is a specific case where this is useful. Um, in the generic sense, it's not useful because we're concerned with running, I didn't really talk about the, the large scale aspect of these calculations, but typically we want to run these calculations on maybe 1,000 GPUs. Um, I was kind of focusing more on the one GPU case here. Because we have MPI there, and you always need to s communicate with MPI, and MPI is not something you can mix with the nested parallelism approach at the moment. Um, nested parallelism isn't so important. Where it is actually important, um, or it could potentially, <coughs> Where it could be important is when we, we um, have a preconditioner called a domain decomposition preconditioner, or Schwarz preconditioner. And that is a communication reducing preconditioner where you do a lot more work on the GPU without interacting with the network or with the CPU at all. And so that's a linear solver which runs on one GPU only. Um, in parallel, all the GPUs are running these independent solvers. And in that specific case, having the nested parallelism would be useful. Um, though I haven't implemented it. Um, just lack of time. But that, that, the nested parallelism approach would be interesting if you, have, um, if you want the CPU to be doing something like a coarse grid solve at the same time, it doesn't have to, if you want the CPU to be doing work at the same time as the GPU uh, without having to worry about CPU threads um, controlling the GPU, taking away from the CPU performance of running its own work, then the nested parallelism approach is a good way to think about doing things then because you can, can re really decouple the CPU and the GPU. So this is a future optimization to think about. Thanks.